Okay, so welcome back. Thank you for for joining us again. Uh, we are ready to to start with our second talk. Uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Thomas Prosen from the University of Ljubljana, and Thomas is going to tell us about exactly solved models of many body quantum chaos. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to give a uh, talk in this uh, seminar. Um, of course, it would be even nicer to give a live talk uh, in front of the live audience, but then, uh, what can we do these days? So, um, let's see how this, ah, okay, so, so I mean, I also thought, I would like to thank Predrag for giving uh, his talk before me, uh, which I will refer to a couple of times, many times actually, I hope because he gave very excellent motivation uh, for many of the things that I will actually use in my talk. Uh, uh, so I don't have to motivate why I sort of considered what I would like to do a many body quantum physics version of cat maps. I mean, now you of course all, all know very well what cat maps are, but uh, basically if you have now learned in the Predrax talk, what is the many body cat map, classical cat map, uh, my talk will be about uh, a toy model of quantum many body cat maps. So models which can be exactly treated, which can be treated in terms of linear algebra or uh, analytical methods or al algebra in, in this case, algebraic methods. Uh, but still, I mean, they are sufficiently complicated so that they, have, they are uh, kind of uh, reflecting uh, properties of quantum chaos. So. Uh, this is supposed to be, this slide is supposed to be a short menu of what I'm going to cover in my talk. Uh, also, it's supposed to introduce the two heroes of this talk, which are Bruno Bertini and Pavel Kos. Uh, Bruno was a uh, postdoc uh, in our group for the last three years. He just left yesterday, so I'm probably still feeling a bit sentimental about this. And Pavel is still around, he has another year. And I think this was a really great adventure for us three to uh, basically endeavor into these projects uh, in for the last two, 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 two and a half years. And a short uh, sort of summary uh, of these results, which I'm going to cover in this, in this talk is basically these two PRLs. Uh, so it's a, a, a result on uh, exactly so, okay. So the idea of course is to have an exactly solved model of chaos just in a way that you know, you're used to look at textbooks of dynamics and we find exactly sort of models of dynamics, which are not actually integrable in the sense that trajectories are uncomputable, but you can compute correlation functions exactly like in cat maps or Baker maps. So, or you can compute other stuff. Like for example, in the first sort of uh, work that I'm going to discuss, uh, we were able to compute uh, the central object of uh, spectral statistics, which you can then compare to uh, standard, let's say, uh, uh, gauge of quantum chaos, which is the random matrix theory. And uh, you can find uh, agreement with random matrix theory. So this would be for us definition of quantum chaos. And the second uh, is about correlation functions as Boris already mentioned quickly. Uh, there are these uh, very curious uh, symmetries between space and time in this disclet space time lattice models, which allow us to basically um, compute stuff which you could not compute for generic dynamics. So these dynamics, which I will call their dual unitary or dual unitary models, is basically the, the general, general framework of exactly solvable chaotic dynamics. I mean, these dynamics did not be chaotic. It can also be integrable, but it has, uh, you know, it has a full actually ergodic hierarchy. So for people who are trained in dynamics, they will know exactly what I mean by ergodic hierarchy. So we, we have now an example of a quantum, quantum many body systems where you could basically find all examples of a chaotic hierarchy that is from non-ergodic through ergodic and non-mixing through ergodic and mixing. And uh, then I probably time will not permit for the third point from my, uh, to the, uh, will not permit me to, to cover the third uh, 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 course in my menu, uh, but uh, hopefully I will at least give you some flavor of it. So, I mean, I can then exactly calculate also some more interesting objects, more interesting, I mean, let's say uh, other objects uh, like, uh, measures of dynamical complexity like dynamical entropies or even operator entanglement, operator entropies. And uh, I mean, as we already discussed after the Predrax talk, I mean, I think uh, one of the issues is also, I mean, whether you can show some results on perturbative or structural stability. So before I lose you, before I lose some of you in some technicalities, which this talk necessarily will have, even though I'll try to skip as much as possibly the technicalities, 
But let me now give you the first, before I start, let me give you the, 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 the central take, take home message. I mean, you know, in particular, since this seminar is about quantum field theory and chaos, I mean, uh, I mean, what I would like to suggest here is since, you know, we can suggest that there might exist exactly treatable models of many body chaos, then this may be also a change of perspective or change of paradigm when you do perturbative physics. You know, usually when you do perturbative physics, you just do perturbation theory around your free or integrable theory, which you can control exactly, right? But here I would suggest that, okay, since we can control exactly the ergodic or fully chaotic, uh, exactly solvable many body chaotic system, maybe we can make perturbative expansion around this. So, I mean, this would be a kind of manifestation of structural stability of perturbatively stable uh, quantum many body chaotic system. So, I mean, we have, I will certainly not be have time to go into that, but for those who are curious, I suggest to read a recent uh, reprint, which was put on the archive at the end of June. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, yeah, let me now just try to define some, 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 some uh, uh, concepts which will be uh, for me the central, or at least for the first half of my talk, it will be the central object which I will try to address. Uh, which is the spectral statistics or, or, or spectral two-point function for the spectral form factor. And again, I mean, before I go to that, I wanted to motivate uh, why I'm using uh, uh, discrete time dynamics. I think after Predrag's talk, I don't need that motivation anymore. I mean, uh, he's perfectly happy in doing discrete time dynamics. Maybe not all physicists are happy because they like to see Hamiltonians. I don't have to see Hamiltonians, but if you want to see Hamiltonians, it is the Floquet dynamics that you are, we are interested in. So it's a periodically driven Hamiltonian. And uh, the uh, U is the one period propagator, right? I mean, you just so-called Floquet propagator or Floquet operator, which is the just time order, inter time order exponential over one period of the drive. The drive is periodic with period P. And after you have this, you know, unitary instead of a Hamiltonian, you have a now generator. You don't have a group now, you don't have, an, Algebra, now Hamiltonian is a member of the algebra, but you are now having a member of the group, which is the, directly the, the dynamical group, if you want, uh, 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 the, 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 the propagator, which, I mean, the, 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 the operator, which you can then iterate uh, in, in integer time, with integer, integer time, so this is the clock operator. So now, so what we will then be interested in, will be interested in the spectrum of quasi-energies, so in the language of random matrix theory, then we'll be interested in circular or unitary uh, uh, random matrices. Yeah? But let's just, before en entering dynamics or random matrix, let's just define the central object that I'll try to you know, flash for you, I mean, or, or compute later. This is, as I mentioned already, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a two-point function of a spectrum uh, when you consider a spectrum as a gas in one dimension. So now you have these uh, eigenvalues of the unitary, which I will, so, you know, which I will call, which are called quasi-energies. And uh, so uh, the spectrum of the unitary is the e to the minus i phi, and phi are real numbers, which are mod to pi, so they are points on a circle, right? So now you have a gas, basically, uh, which is confined in a box with periodic boundary conditions or in a circle, so it's a compact set. So this gas cannot escape to infinity, so it's fine, it's bound. So that's why also we like uh, discrete time dynamics because when you take Hamiltonians, Hamiltonians have spectrum on a real line. So, you know, if you let this spectrum go, if you let this, you know, gas evol evolve with respect to some sort of formal time, then, you know, it can go to infinity, it can escape to infinity, but this time, since you have confined to a compact set, this, 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 this gas will uh, uh, be bounded by, uh, uh, it, it will be, uh, confined to a circle. Okay, so now you have this, this uh, 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 a gas, which you call a spectrum, and uh, you, you compute uh, one point and two point functions. I mean, one point function, you just normalize to one because you, know, you expect that there is democracy on a circle so that when you average over, uh, uh, so this is, the, this is the, the one point function, but this is you know, it's a density. The average of this is called one point function and the average you want to be one. And then you define the, the connected two-point function, which is the, you know, the R of theta. Theta is now the shift. And then you again average over the circle. And uh, the Fourier transform of this two-point function is the so-called spectral form factor. And there is a two-line calculation, which we could do, but uh, you know, it's, it's done here, but I don't really have time to go through, I mean, to follow it in detail, but you should trust me or do it in the 30 minutes of spare time. 
uh, namely that the Fourier transform of the two-point function is just the trace of the propagator Floch operator square uh, to power t modulus square minus a delta function at time zero, so that is minus this peak at time zero, which in or discrete time dynamics is really precise uh, Kronecker delta. Uh, there is another, another kind of uh, neat uh, expression for the two-point function, which is just a double sum over the spectrum, right, uh, with the formal parameter or Fourier parameter t, which is in this case an integer because the spectrum lives on a unit circle. Okay, so now you remember this, 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 this definition. So this is a two-point function. It tells you, it, it basically knowing all, everything you can say about two-point functions is a complete two-point function. The argument is not the, uh, the energy or the quasi energy, but it's a Fourier variable, which is the integer time, which is give you the number of repetitions of the Floch drive. Okay, the, then there's a caveat. Of course, this would be a very nice, uh, at least conceptually, a very clean uh, uh, express, expression for the two point function. The problem is that this guy is not self averaging. That is, if you compute it for an individual realization for the individual dynamics, the dynamical system, for the individual uh, uh, Floch system, then this does, just doesn't make sense. I will show you later some numerics, you know, to see what I mean, but it doesn't make sense. But so in practice or in, you know, in real calculations, what people have to do is they have to average over an ensemble of uh, nearby models or, you know, even running average over time is sometimes sufficient or, or something. But at least there has to be some sort of probabilistic measure with respect to which you average this, this, this object. And this I will denote as k bar, which will be the, Probably average spectral form factor. And now let's see what random matrix theory has to say about this. So this is a very sensitive, this is a very sensitive measure of quantum dynamics. And actually it's, you know, it has also very nice, if you want practical interpretation, practical interpretation, because it's just like a recurrence. It's kind of, you know, you can write a trace in terms of random states, right? You can write a trace as an expectation value of the operator in a random state, average over an ensemble high random ensemble of random states. So then this would just mean this is an average uh, return probability or return amplitude if you want, but then you modulus, take a modulus square, so it's kind of return probability uh, for quantum dynamics to come back after time t. So to come to the state that it started from at time precisely at time t. So it's something that actually, I think experimentalists these days, I mean, we have a couple of discussions occasionally from time to time with the experimentalists, but I think in principle, there is no problem to measure this quantity. So it's not something that very academic, it's really something that, you know, it's, it's a real time quantity. So it can, it's as accessible, let's say, to, to, to modern day quantum simulators. So and see this, 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 this quantity is very sensitive to dynamics that is for, for uh, random matrices. That is, this is a results, is a results for uh, where U is taken at random from a appropriate ensemble of random matrices. So if random matrices are uh, circular orthogonal or circular unitary ensemble, which are only discriminated by having or not having a time reversal symmetry, then you have uh, uh, this universal behavior of spectral form factor, which is basically for short time. So for times which is much less than the so-called Heisenberg time and the Heisenberg time in integer units now is just the dimension of the Hilbert space. So for me, the dimension of the Hilbert space will be this curly M. So, I mean, for times much less than that, then, you know, for unitary ensemble, this is this precisely linear function until it hits the plateau, which is just the, the Heisenberg time again, and then it stays constant, it saturates, yeah. Then for uh, systems with time reversal symmetry, then this, is, this becomes a smooth function. It has some non-analyticity non at uh, Heisenberg time, but still you don't see it. I mean, this was anyway drawn by my hand. It's not a precise function, which I, when, which I, which I brought here. But anyway, I mean, this is uh, known results from the random matrix theory. People can compute that. This is just an average over either Dyson's uh, circular orthogonal or unitary ensemble. And then there's a third ensemble, which I will not mention here. It's a so-called symplectic ensemble, which has uh, another universal behavior. Okay, so now this is all fine. Of course, random matrices are very artificial uh, uh, concepts. No question is how I can compare this to real, real world dynamics. And what people typically find is that, okay, this is all fine after time, which is longer than the so-called Ehrenfest or Taoist time, depending on the community you talk to or the context in which you are thinking about. So there is a shortest time after which, you know, before which you don't, you cannot really expect random matrix theory to apply because dynamics has so much structure. The, the evolution operator has so much structure. You see locality, for example, of interactions and so on. In semi-classical systems, you have periodic orbits. You have this, you know, uh, you see still, uh, that dynamics is you know, coming from deterministic Hamiltonian. 
it's not random as chaotic. And so, I mean, you cannot really see random matrices after a very short time, but you know, uh, for times longer than the so-called tau SRM first time, then you would see universal random matrix behavior. I mean, this is what you expect, let's say, for dynamics, which is chaotic, yeah? The question is, I mean, you know, how can you prove this? And uh, this is basically the point of the conjecture, which has been put, out, put, 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 put down in the 80s, uh, proposed in the 80s, and uh, it's been probably the most stimulating, I mean, conjecture or uh, question which has driven the field of quantum chaos, uh, which was mainly qu uh, questions related to single particle physics, but still of systems which are classically completely chaotic or you know, have some degree of chaos, uh, like this XY system that Frederick mentioned, I mean, systems which have some regular and some chaotic structures in classical phase space. Uh, people would then predict that systems which are fully chaotic or mostly chaotic, which almost all tra tra trajectories are chaotic, should behave according to the appropriate ensemble of random matrix theory. So this was a conjecture, which was very hard to prove and actually is not proven even today, but today at least we have a good understanding why it holds. Okay, so now uh, I didn't want to sp spend so, so much time on this. I mean, but just, you know, to have a complete, to complete the introduction and the motivation for this, let me just go through these main steps of how people understand uh, quantum chaos conjecture. I mean, some people also call this, sorry. Sorry for that. Some people would call this uh, Bohigas or bohigas jamani schmidt conjecture according to the most articulated paper which proposed this uh, in 1984. <clears throat> and uh, so there is actually, there was then some progress uh, on understanding this, why this is true. I mean, as I say, there is no mathematical proof of this conjecture, but at least people now understand why this is true. And basically they can formally expand the spectral form factor to all orders in tau or if you want to all orders in h bar, I mean, there has to be an h bar parameter here, which is the effective value of Planck constant. And, uh, and yeah, and then, uh, you know, people have actually expand, they able to formally expand this form factor to all orders in, in, in n, and they found that the result exactly agrees with the random matrices. So basically this is as good as you can hope. And the first result, which is the most intuitive result is already due to Berry from 85. <clears throat> which is a so-called diagonal approximation, which is basically expressing the form factor. And now I should remind you again what form factor is. It's just a trace of u to the t square. Now remember, you just use Feynman path integral formula for semi-classical systems. You do stationary phase approximation for small h bar, and you arrive at the periodic orbit sums. Uh, it was mentioned also in Predex talks. I mean, there is this very nice, very fancy periodic orbit theory, and people can basically, you know, there is a double sum, right? Because this is a second point, two point, two point quantity, but then, you know, there is a lot of destructive interference between terms of the sums, which are sums over periodic orbits, these are actions over periodic orbits. And, you know, there is a lot of inter destructive interference, but, you know, the constructive interference happens only when the two actions, the two phases are equal. And these two phases are when the two actions along two orbits, P and P prime are the same. And these are only when the two orbits are actually the same for systems which have no time reversal, or is for orbits which are the same or time reversal of one another for systems which have time reversal symmetry, which gives the factor of two. So this already explains the short time, short time uh, agreement of you know, chaos to, to, to random matrix theory. Of course, I neglected a lot of stuff here, so this is very sketchy. And uh, I just want to say that you know, people have then pushed this further. I mean, there's people were not very happy with this because you know, people are not happy when they have to do this random phase approximation. So we want to understand why you have the interference. So then there was the next step of progress was only 16 years later by Zieber and Richter who were able to identify the next term in the expansion. And they attributed the next term to the periodic orbits which have more complicated topology. So there is a basically classification of periodic orbits in terms of topology, meaning in terms of how many times they encounter each other or themselves. So there is that the periodic orbits which in configuration space look like this, like number eight or number in, or sign for infinity. So they have this, this region where they close encounter themselves and uh, this gives second order term. And then uh, Miller, Sebastian Miller for his PhD in the group of Hake was able actually to, to make the full blown uh, classification of all the terms in the expansion in terms of uh, all the rewirings, all the possible self encounters of periodic orbits, you know, according to the kind of railway switches, which, 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 which would uh, give you then the combinatorics, which gives exactly the random matrices. I mean, that's a very nice <coughs> combinatorics if you want, or, or, or diagrammatics if you want. Uh, there are lots of assumptions there, so I'm say, uh, what I say is this is not a, a rigorous mathematics, but still, I mean, it's very nice at least to understand why it works. <clears throat> but 
My talk is not about that. My talk is about systems where there is no edge bar. So my talk is about fermionic or spinman half systems where you not, cannot even in principle think of a small parameter or large parameter. So the only parameter in this game is the system size, number of spins, number of fermions. Uh, this is a large parameter, so small parameter would be one over L. Yeah, there is no other small parameter. That's the assumption. So remarkably, people have found, and there are results much older than this reference, but this I give, uh, this I took from a review paper by Marcos Rigo and Lea Santos. Uh, there are many results, and people actually understand this as a definition of quantum chaos, you know, uh, about uh, uh, looking at quantum uh, many body systems like in one dimension, so systems which have structure like spin chains. By the way, I wanted to stress that and I forgot in the introduction, but my talk is also not about, you know, there are, when you, when people mention uh, exactly solved models of quantum chaos, I mean, people probably first think of SYK model which is probably the simplest uh, exactly solved quantum chaotic model, but this is not what my talk is about because SYK model is a zero dimensional model or is uh, in some sense structureless model. What I have in mind now are models which have locality structure. So they, they should be extended in at least one spatial dimension like spin chains. So, I mean, I want to understand how, you know, structure, spatial structure leads to quantum chaos. Yeah? And the simplest models of this type are these nearest neighbor spin chains like this one or fermionic chains, this one is written in fermionic language. But in order to be non-integrable, one has to introduce second order hopping, second side hopping, or second side interaction. If both of these terms are killed, this is equivalent to Heisenberg, anisotropic Heisenberg model. And it would be integrable, meaning that uh, level spacings would be Poisson distributed. I have, not, uh, I have not defined level spacing, but I assume that more, if not all, but most of you have you know, seen level spacing distributions. This is so common these days. So this is just level spacing, it's not form factor, it's much more hard to compute analytically, it's much easier to analyze numerically. So people who do numerics usually prefer level spacings. And you know, for integral systems, you expect uh, Poisson, which is the so-called Berry-Tabor conjecture. It's again, not proven, but it's very intuitive. Why it should be so? But then if you break integrability, then what you see basically is a gradual crossover or phase transition in thermodynamic limit, if you want to uh, uh, Wigner Dyson or to a random matrix spectral level spacings, or if you want, also spectral form factor should go to random matrix. So the question, I mean, how on earth I can imagine that, you know, very simple structured models like this one, where there is basically no random parameters. I mean, there are, this model has just four parameters, four real numbers, JJ prime, VV prime. Yeah. So it's Hamiltonian, it's hugely sparse. And uh, it has in each row only two L elements, right? Uh, and it has dimension two to the L, exponentially in L, but it's connect connectivity, you know, connectivity has just two L uh, for each, uh, if you want Fox, Fox state to, to, to all, all connected Fox states. Uh, so how on earth this can, you know, such a structured uh, sparse matrix would have spectrum, which is random matrix, you know, it's given by random matrix theory. To me, this was a puzzle, you know, for at least 20 years, I mean, uh, I was, you know, amazed by this and uh, not, so not so many people were amazed in the old days, but then more and more, you know, the community somehow changed, people get amazed by different sort of questions. So, I mean, now many people are kind of excited about this. <clears throat> and the question is, why is it so? So, so I mean, I, I just, you know, this is just the last kind of slide from my, from the introduction, let's say. Uh, and this is just some numerics of the a model that I will discuss uh, later, which is the skittism model. Uh, and uh, this has been done by, by Carlos Pineda and myself in 2007. It's just, you know, this just to show you what does it mean that spectral form factor is not self-averaging. I mean, I go, I hope you see the sand, the black, black sand here. I mean, this is just the numerical values of uh, spectral form factor if you compute it without averaging. I mean, there is no disorder here. There is no kind of uh, randomness to average over here, but you know, what we average over is simply a moving time average. Simply, I mean, this is like uh, a few 10,000 levels. So we average over, I think, 50 or 100 neighboring levels or neighboring time steps, if you want. Time is now discrete and also time goes to, you know, the order of systems, Hilbert space dimension steps. So the time step would be now, uh, we, we, we coarse grain over time step of the order of 50 or 100. And you see that basically then you get a smooth curve. I think the blue, the black is the numerics and the red is the random matrix. Yeah? So it's perfect agreement with random matrix theory. I don't want to go into detail what is the symbols. It's different momentum sectors, but you know, now, okay, now this was puzzling questions, at least to me were puzzling for many, many years. And, you know, uh, I almost concluded that this question is kind of unsolvable. Uh, 
But then, you know, we were able to find some mechanisms to explain this. And uh, actually, it so happened that it was like a simultaneous, simultaneous progress with two groups. There was our group and there was a John Shocker group from Oxford, who basically at the same months, uh, the, the two, these two papers appeared in the archive in the same months, proposed two type of mechanisms which explain validity of random matrix theory in extended quantum systems. How, how come, how, how, how can random matrix theory come about? Actually, the, 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 the papers of Chocolate Group actually had to use still some randomness and some uh, large Hilbert space dimension. But in our paper, actually, we addressed spin on half systems. So really, H particle to one. But, I have, but we had to use some sort of random phase approximation still. So it was not fully analytical. I mean, it was still a random analytical model assumptions, which were very, very reasonable, but you know, it's not really the, yet the, 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 the <clears throat> what we wanted. But it was the first, I think the first result. Uh, again, my talk is not about this, so we're not going to any technicality about this, but you know, I really want to address the most exciting question here, which is uh, spin chains with local interactions. Yeah? So I mean, <clears throat> now uh, here I come to the model, which I will discuss. I mean, okay, I will discuss then a more general, general class of models later, but you know, the, 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 the toyish model, the toy model, the cat map, uh, of spin chains, if you want, the many body cats of, uh, of spin chains, I mean, are this quantum easing model, uh, which is probably the simplest spin one half. Well, I mean, I mean, this is arguably uh, arguable what is the simplest, but it's really a simple spin one half model where interaction is really easing like, so that all interaction terms commute, which is very nice. <laughs> but then there is this uh, single particle terms, which is the longitudinal field and the transverse field. I mean, you can distribute fields, you know, that, and then there is the, you know, the point is that this is kicked. So basically you kick, you have the classical ISIC model if you want, and then you kick it periodically with transverse field in periodic time steps. And this model has three coupling, coupling constants. There is a, a, a coupling between spins J, and then there is uh, longitudinal fields, which I will allow to be side dependent for some technical reason. And then there is a transverse field, which I will ask to be constant. Yeah? Now, uh, <clears throat> And then of course the Flocky operator, since this is just a kicked uh, driving, one can integrate it. Of, I mean, the time, time, order, uh, time ordered exponential is simply a product of two exponentials, right? So e to the i h kicked, e to the i h ising. And you know, and this I will call u kicked ising, yeah? And this model is actually very interesting. Again, I mean, I proposed this model in the around 2000 and uh, at first uh, very few people cared about this. Uh, but then, you know, uh, now it has been kind of recognized as probably the harmonic oscillator of quantum chaos, uh, of extended quantum chaos of extended 1D quantum systems. Uh, there has been some papers addressing some dynamical issues which are very interesting about this model, but you know, again, it's not about, my talk is not about that. So let's go, let's go straight to the, the, the computation of spectral form factor for this model. So now, one point of my talk is basically to give you a, a flavor of the, of, the, of the method of calculation of how to approach the problem of calculating spectral form factor for this model. So for that, we need to do some sort of disorder averaging because as we, as we have learned, uh, disorder, I mean, the spectral form factor is not self-averaging, so one has to do some averaging with respect to some parameters. So it turns out to be uh, very convenient to average over longitudinal magnetic fields. But since the, we don't want to treat uh, large disorder, actually we want to, switch off this order. I mean, actually we want to think of even switching off this order at the end of calculation. So this order is basically just a technical trick, technical regularization, which makes our quantity very defined. So, okay, so what we do now is basically we compute the disorder average spectral form factor, where this order average is like a IID Gaussian, you know, this order, is, I mean, the longitudinal field is an IID Gaussian variable with uh, average H bar, now not Planck constant, but H average and uh, variance sigma. And now it turned out, turns out before you maybe lose me in the, some details of the, of, of the trick, but what it turns out is that, you know, the results are actually not depending on the value of sigma at all. So you can take the limit of sigma going to zero from above at the end of calculation to zero. So, sorry, to zero from above at the end of calculation. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, this, 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 this order is just a technical trick how to get, how to get, uh, but of course, I mean, any amount of disorder in thermodynamic limit is a strong perturbation. So it is important, you know, to, 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 to induce chaos if you want to induce quantum chaos and to make your quantity behaving like a random matrix. 
Okay, so now this is just some numerics to simulate, to, to stimulate uh, you to have this quantity in which is interesting. So this is uh, numerics for I think 15 sites for different amount of disorder. Uh, the more disorder you have, the less fluctuating the quantity is. Uh, but you know, it turns out that in thermodynamic limits, you know, even short time. Now this, you know, if you want tau less time would be something like here, but you know, this is finite system. So when you increase the system size and increase uh, the sample size, then actually it turns out that every, everything becomes linear even from time one on. So there will be no, basically that there is no tau less and no NFS time in this model. NFS time is, is one. In some sense, this model is like a critical, cl critical model of chaos. It's, it's, it's chaotic on all time scales or, or, or quasi energy scales. Okay, so now let me just flash the, the statement that we can actually prove. So for this model, we can prove a very simple statement that is for odd times, for some technical reason, we can rigorously treat only odd times. Again, it has to do with the rich symmetry of this model, which is a bit richer than COE. I mean, we first believe that this model is a generic representative of COE, it has time reversal symmetry. It turns out it has a second, second time reversal symmetry. So it's a bit richer, it belongs to some other random matrix, random matrix class. And for that reason, it's hard to treat. I mean, actually the random matrix classes for odd and even times are different. So it turns out it's kind of much easier to treat odd times. So what we can prove actually is just that for odd times, this uh, spectral form factor in thermodynamic limit exactly follows random matrix theory for times larger than seven. For times less or equal to five, there is a short time fluke, which is just correction, you know, order one correction. And then for even times, we have conjecture that there is a, uh, just 2t plus one. Uh, and again, short time, short time effects for times up to 10. <clears throat> Okay, so now uh, this is one of the main uh, results I want to stress. So uh, we can show that uh, spectral form factor agrees with the under matrix theory uh, for any amount of disorder, even for disorder going to zero at the end of calculation. Moreover, results are independent of the average uh, longitudinal field. So they are even, you know, you can show random matrix behavior even if you expand around integral point H uh, average equals zero would be a transverse field easing model, which is uh, basically equivalent to quadratic fermion, so it's integrable. So it should be just a, a disorder, small disorder uh, uh, perturbation of an integral model, which would be chaotic as well. Okay, I mean, I think I already stressed that. <clears throat> so now let me just spend like five minutes to uh, show you how you can show this result because it's a kind of a general, general idea of how to, to do that. And I will later try to generalize this. So, um, I mean, the idea is basically, don't, this is like, you know, almost like a two dist I mean, you know, you know that there is this analogy between one plus one D quantum systems and two D classical stat mech. Uh, again, we use this uh, mapping here. So basically we can write this, uh, this trace of U to the T, which is the, you know, central ingredient in spectral form factor. We write it as a, as a partition function of a two D classical easing model. It turns out that this is just a partition function of a two D classical easing model, which can be evaluated through the row or column transfer matrix. So now if time is horizontal and space is vertical, then the usual propagator, the Floquet propagator is just the column transfer matrix. But then there is also a row transfer matrix and row transfer matrix takes a constant field, but then the field changes from time to time, that is from space to space. But still, I mean, it, turns out, it so turns out that this row transfer matrix is algebraically exactly the same as column transfer matrix, just that the parameters of, so it's again a Kipteasing model on a, on a, on a ring, these are periodic boundary conditions. So on a ring of size T instead of size L. So uh, this is what we call a duality relation. That is basically, it's just an identity, you know, partition function written in terms of two types of transfer matrices. But in terms of dynamics, this is actually interesting. So it's nice to spell it out. So uh, first, this is in real time. Second, this is in real space. And of course, since field is disordered, meaning that now you have uh, time dependent driving, right? I mean, in each drive in space, you have different strength of the field, but this field is homogeneous. So this epsilon is a homogeneous, it's a, a constant uh, vector, which has constant components. So basically what you have now is a mapping which maps J and B, which are the two parameters of this, of this model to J tilde and B tilde, right? So U tilde is the same, but it has J tilde and B tilde. The point is that this, this mapping is, is in general complex. So the J tilde, B tilde are complex numbers, even for J B being real. So U tilde is not a unitary matrix. But for some special values of J and B, which are pi over four or plus minus pi over four, this model is what we call self-dual, meaning that the bo both of these propagators, U and U tilde are actually unitary matrices. 
Actually, this has been noted also in paper by, by, by Boris and company in 2016. Uh, and I think Boris also has older papers where he notes uh, uh, very similar properties uh, of this space-time duality. So, I mean, this is actually, you know, what we have shown here is that this is actually very useful and it allows us to push through the calculation of spectral form factor. And okay, now let me spend one slide on how we actually do it. So now it's, it's not as simple as that. I mean, of course, now we want to do the disorder average, right? Disorder average is the key to simplify the calculation. But you know, before doing the disorder average, you have to introduce a second copy because it's a two point one function. So we have to, you know, spectral form factor is trace of u to the t times trace of u to the t complex conjugate or you know, modulus square. So you need two copies and then you average, right? But now since you do the, you, you can use duality formula means you, you do it instead of column, you, you use row transfer matrices. That means that you basically to take the tensor product of two copies of T sides. So that is two spin rings of circum circumference T. And then you, do, then you average, right? So it's like, you know, symbolically you can write this in terms of tensor products. So now your Hilbert space becomes of dimension two to the two T. So tensor product of two spaces of size two to the T. And uh, these two propagators are actually, you know, uh, now uh, just uh, U tilde. And this U tilde now has to be unitary, right? So now this will actually be an interesting and uh, useful calculation when this U tilde will be, will be, will be unitary, right? So we'll ask now to be at this self dual point. And uh, now, what, what, now that, you know, what, what this trick buys us is that we can actually do calculation, we can actually do disorder averaging side by side, right? Now we can do side by side. And now basically what spectral form factor amounts to now is just trace to the, now we can pull, the, pull this order averaging in the calculation. And then the spectral form factor is just trace of this transfer matrix, this double transfer matrix or dual uh, you know, we sometimes call these transfer matrices in space like dual transfer matrix. And this is, yeah, this is uh, 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 the dual transfer matrix for the calculation of spectral form factor. Okay, so now, okay, this is, looks maybe formal and complicated, but it's actually very simple. So once you pull this, you know, because you can do more, you can actually compute, everything is just Gaussian integral, right? And then you take, you know, now this is still general, but I assume that I will take, take just a Gaussian distribution of, 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 of longitudinal fields. And when you do that, then you actually can ca calculate this Gaussian integral, it's just a Gaussian integral. And then this dual transfer matrix becomes just a tensor product of two unitaries. This guy has an assumption unitary times something which is a contraction, which is a, you know, an operator which has a spectrum strictly inside unit disk. And now this is, this is really blue, this is really cool. I mean, it allows us to, to, to push to the calculation further. And I, I think, I have to skip all the details of this calculation because I want to finish within, let's say, an hour and five minutes or so. And uh, I'd be happy to, you know, in the, to, to go into some more detail in the discussion se session. But um, yeah, the only thing what I want to stress from this from, from this from this calculation is that the yeah, calculation of computation of spectral form factor now amounts to cal you know to to computing uh, trace of u to the t in thermodynamic limit. I forgot the trace here, or yeah. You have to do the trace at the end. But you see, I mean, when you do the thermodynamic limit, what you have to basically look at is just the spectrum of this dual transfer matrix. And since, since we have, we'll show that this is the product of unitary and the contraction, spectrum can be within unit disk, that's a trivial proof. So the spectrum can either be on unit circle, which means it survives thermodynamic limit, or it's gapped within unit disk, which means it goes to exponentially quick to zero. So you know, there is no contribution in thermodynamic limit. So basically what we have to do now, basically we have to count how many eigenvalues remain on the circle, in particular, how many eigenvalues are exactly, exactly one. It turns out that we can actually show that the only eigenvalues in the unit circle can actually be one or minus one, or at, for even times, odd times, sorry, only one. So basically we have to just calculate eigenvalues one. I mean, this is just some numerics for the, for the, for the gap. I mean, I, I told you we can show the gap is positive, but how big it is, we have to do numerics. But, you know, uh, again, uh, how to count number of eigenvalues one of this transfer matrix then now uh, maps to a nice algebraic problem, meaning of computing the dimension of commutant of some algebra generated by uh, generators of SU2 and a simple operator, which is basically just a, you know, it's, 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 it's a counting operator, which counts number of domain walls in, in, in any zinc model, in quantum zinc model. So, I mean, as I say, I mean, I don't want to go into any details of this calculation. I want to just, stress that this is a very cute, simple algebraic problem, has nothing to do with dynamics in principle. I mean, it doesn't look that it has anything to do with dynamics. It's a problem in representation theory, if you want. 
now we have to count, you know, we have to show that some representation of this algebra is irreducible. That's basically the proof. Anyway, and the fact that this, you know, these operators are all invariant under the dihedral group, that is, uh, they are invariant on the shift of uh, respect to you know, time, and they are also invariant with respect to reflection in time, meaning that they are invariant under the dihedral group, meaning that there is 2t, that is the, 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 the strength of the dihedral group, 2t elements which commute simultaneously, that is the shifts and reflections that commute simultaneously with these two operators. And the question is, the, 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 the crux of the proof is just to show that there are no other operators, that this is the complete, complete uh, you know. Okay, I mean, it's a kind of uh, Schur lemma type of proof. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, again, I mean, I don't want to go into detail of this proof, so I, let me just skip here. Now, this actually, this method buys you much more. So there are other stuff that you can compute. For example, you can compute entanglement entropy. And there was this paper which we, uh, where we have done that uh, with Bruno and Pavel. And uh, again, the result which you expect is very simple. Now, this result actually does not have to do with chaos necessarily because you find this result also for integral models like, C, you know, some models of CFT. Uh, you know, for which this type of uh, behavior has been first calculated by Calabrese and Cardi. So we can show that uh, diagonal entropy of a block of size n in thermodynamic limit grows until you reach uh, until time 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 n. You know, and then you basically saturate yeah, <laughs> to maximum entropy of of, of of a random state in the block. Okay. Uh, question. Question. Yes. Yes. So um, this is a rainy entropy. So the limit right. doesn't depend on n at all. Doesn't depend on, exactly. Doesn't depend on n, which means that the entanglement spectrum is flat. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So as I say, I mean, I have to be quick here because I wanted to to to, to present some more, let's say, general framework. I mean, this has kind of very isolated results. You know, we can prove, let's say, very strong things about very special models. But this model, as we have shown previously, is chaotic, so it is maybe you know, not so uninteresting. Now, let me now go to the basically the main kind of uh, concept which I would like to discuss further uh, until the end of this talk, which is sort of the general class of models which allow this type of calculation. So now we can ask, you know, what do we actually need? What, what kind of dynamics do we actually need so that we can be able to calculate exactly spectral form factors and moreover, as we have shown now, also correlation functions. And the point is, I mean, as you already remember from before, what I need now is that the row and transfer matrices of this, of this partition function formulation of quantum propagator uh, are unitary, which means that I can also view my dynamics in space as unitary dynamics. But let, let me now start from a simple object, which is just an elementary gate, or if you want in terms of field theory as two particle scattering matrix. So now I, you know, I have particles on the line and now I allow nearest neighbor interactions, so only neighbors can interact. So now I have this two particle scattering matrix or unitary gate. And now I ask this, 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 this unitary gate <coughs> to be unitary, as I said already. So i, j are in states and k, l are out states. So my time now runs vertically. I'm sorry for the previous convention, which was different, but now I use the standard, let's say convention. Time goes vertically and space is horizontal. So now, and I will later draw some quantum circuits with this gate, but now this will be just like in and out state, right? But now I will define uh, tilde mapping, which will be, some people would call this a reshuffling mapping, which will now change the meaning of the in and out states. Now I will basically define this u tilde as something which is exactly the same, but takes i and k as in states and spits out j and l and out, as out states, right? Now this is just a definition of, of, of this. And this is well defined for any finite dimensional unitaries. So I will only consider finite dimensional, let's say qubits, uh, where this u will be four by four unitary or any other finite dimensional uh, quantum gate. Qubits, two qubits. And now I will define dual unitarity as something which is uh, unitary both with respect to space and you know with respect to both of these interpretations, right? So this defines a new mathematical structure. Let's say it's not a group, it's a set of dual unitaries. Actually, it corresponds to some nice, uh, nice concept in the language of open quantum systems and unitary channels, but I will not go into that because probably it would be too much for one hour. But I, I just want to stress there is a nice, um, nice, and I will actually show some of this uh, link later when I will calculate correlation functions. So there's a nice link to, to open systems and quantum channels, that is to noisy quantum systems. It has to do also with the question that was discussed with, with Predrag in the discussion session before. I mean, even though here this is many body unitary dynamics, it has something to do with, 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 with you know, because you know, we have extended quantum systems, information can escape to infinity. So, I mean, it's not surprising that it has some resemblance of the dissipative single particle or zero dimensional dynamics. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, 
So now let me just, you know, uh, again, give you a flavor of a trick that we actually use, but I will not be able to go to show you any details of how we use it, but I, you'll probably get some flavor of, I mean, there's some, some intuition already once you see this, some pictures. I mean, here, what is nice about this idea now is that we can actually reduce all the proofs to, 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 to diagrams and pictures. So now, I mean, you have this unitary and uh, we will plot this unitary with the red box. And then there is the inverse of this unitary or u dagger, which will be the time reversal of it, which will I will denote as a blue box. And the unitarity is simply by combining two boxes vertically, which means that you can you know, uh, forget about, which what we call a forward fusion rule, we could forget about these boxes and just uh, draw uh, st straight lines, right? That would be the trivial uh, manifestation of unitarity in terms of the, these diagrammatics. But it's actually not so you know, trivial because we want to also include the sideways contraction and the sideways contraction of boxes with, which are wired like this would be exactly equivalent to dual unitarity. I mean, this is again a 10 minute calculation which you can do on a piece of paper or on an iPad if you want, but you know, it's really uh, uh, totally straightforward. So now this dual unitarity actually manifests in these diagrams. Right? And then, you know, again, uh, now we can basically using this, this, these unitary circuits, these are really kind of nice models. And I always like to write now unitary circuits with terms, in terms of these 45 degree wires, right? I mean, when you, when you read papers on, on, on random unitaries or unitary circuits, people usually write vertical wires, right? Because they always like to think of something as time. But you know, what we say here now is that time is something, you know, artificial. I mean, you can change space and time, you, you know, you can, uh, consider dynamics in this way or in that way. So I, we prefer to write this uh, really as a, as a kind of vertex model with, with 45 degree angle <coughs> like this. <coughs> okay, so now, uh, right. So now basically the full dynamics now, this would be like for two time steps, two full time steps would be now composed of staggered layers of half time step, which would be like implementing, you know, this now time goes up. And so this would be like, uh, uh, <coughs> I mean, this is a typical brick work, people call it brickwork quantum cir circuit structure, right? It's a typical, typical model, if you want a trotterization of a Hamiltonian for short time step or for any time step, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a toy model of quantum dynamics with discrete time. So what we do is we take uh, even time steps and then odd time steps, even time steps, odd time steps, you know, and this, you know, since these two guys cannot be, I mean, <clears throat> they are kind of uh, interacting. So, you know, you cannot simplify this circuit further. <clears throat> okay, so now this is just a, an example. And again, we have a duality relation. I mean, since we define this dual unitary, we can also define the dual propagator, which would be now this, uh, now the, the usual propagator W would be now uh, a row transfer matrix and the dual one would be column transfer matrix. And again, we have a duality of traces, right? Which is again, just, traces a partition function of this vertex model. And then this would be just uh, uh, two ways of in, uh, contracting the partition function, yeah? which is totally trivial. <clears throat> but now let me just, okay. I mean, I would like to just, uh, yeah, in next 10 minutes, give you then, then some idea how to calculate correlation functions. I mean, there was already mentioned by Boris. I mean, there was, he also had a paper on that uh, recently, you know, on this uh, uh, strange property of this self time self-dual space-time dual models, namely that the correlations can only spread exactly on light cones. Namely now you can actually, using these diagrammatics, you can actually prove this for dual unitary circuits. And uh, <clears throat> now let me just formulate uh, again, uh, space-time local correlation function. So spatial temporal correlation function of local operators as a partition function, as a sort of partition function with some unusual boundary conditions. Uh, using these dual unitary, circuit, dual unitary circuits. <clears throat> so I will define a tensor of two point correlation functions where you put two operators at place X and Y. And my lattice now is composed of integers and half integers. I use this lattice so that integers would mean now the left and the half integer would mean the right, of, you know, because there is this staggering, natural staggering of this uh, light cone, uh, this uh, quantum circuit. So it's good to discriminate between even and odd side. So that's why I use integer and half integer. So this X and Y could be integer or half integer and would uh, designate positions of the two operators. And again, uh, you know, I would just like to consider the full tensor of correlators. So I would have the complete set of traces operators, which are D square minus one of them, right? For D dimensional Hilbert space, for example, for qubits, these are three Pauli matrices. And uh, okay, and uh, right, so now this would be just uh, space-time correlation function, if you want, at infinite temperature. 
And again, this is a Floquet driven uh, dynamics. So there is no other time invariant state in general as infinite temperature state. So, I mean, there is no, in general, no question about Gibbs states and stuff. I mean, the only, the only Gibbs state is an infinite temperature state, right? <clears throat> so this would be just, you know, the most general two point function, dynamical two point function for such a theory you can think of. And, uh, and since there is translation variance in space and time, and the, all these gates are the same in space and time, uh, you can easily find, you can easily show that this is homogeneous in space and time. So it's only a function of X and Y and T of course, because T is already a distance between, temporal distance between A alpha and A beta. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> fine. So now I will just, you know, quickly show how I can prove this property that Boris mentioned already before in the discussion, namely that uh, this tensor of two point correlators, C alpha beta of XT is only non-zero when X is plus minus T. And whether it's plus or minus T depends on the parity of X. So whether it depends on whether you sit on, on uh, this light ray or whether you sit on that light ray. Yeah? So basically the point is now, the correlations can only propagate uh, exactly on, along light rays. <laughs> and uh, before I just show you how to diagrammatically prove this in two slides, which, were, which are just pictures, let me just give you an uh, intuitive worthy explanation why this should be true. I mean, that's again, totally obvious, right? I mean, now you have a theory, which is of course is causal. I mean, it has these local interactions. So nothing can spread faster than in time is discrete. So no information can spread faster than speed, speed one. So everything, all the correlations have to be strictly within light cone, which opens at speed one in space. So that means for X less than T, but since this theory is dual unitary, I can, with, with the same, you know, with the same argument, I can interpret dynamics as dynamics in space. I mean, it's also causal dynamics. You can also show that correlations can spread in spatial cone. That is, they can be only non-zero for T less or equal to X. This means that correlations can only spread in the intersection of these two cones, which means they can only spread along light rays, light rays right? But that's intuitive, right? I mean, still, I mean, this is not mathematics. So mathematically, again, the, the proof is totally trivial. You just write this correlation function from before. Again, you now use unitarity fusion rules to eliminate everything here, right? So then you get this double light cone structure. Again, remember this is uh, on periodic, this is on a torus, so everything has to be uh, contracted, it's a periodic boundary condition. So these two guys are contracted, that is contracted and so on. So now what we, I will show now that basically this is zero if these operators are traceless, unless these two guys sit on the same light, light, light ray. For example, these are the three cases, either as they sit on the same light ray or they are sitting on the same, uh, almost on the same light ray, but on the different parity sites. So X is T minus one, or they are, one operator is strictly inside the cone. So let me just first assume that one operator is strictly inside the cone. Then I use dual unitarity, meaning, meaning that, that I can now, you see these guys are connected, right? So remember the dual fusion rule. Dual fusion rule was this, was this one. I can use it and I can just draw three lines. So these three lines mean, right? I do that, I have these three lines here, okay? And I do this again, because now I see you have fusion rule here. I do this again and again and again until I enter this center. And this means now I have just this guy isolated. This is just trace of A beta, right? This circle is just trace of A beta. And since A beta is traceless, this vanishes. Similarly, I can do this for uh, point two when I sit on the same light ray, but on different parity sites. Then I use dual fusion rule once. I get this circle. This is now a circle because it's connected here. And again, circle, contracted circle is trace A alpha, which is zero by, by the assumption. So I, then I'm left with the case one, which means what I, this is what I want to prove. Okay, now the second property, which I need to really calculate the correlation function is now just to evaluate this. And again, what I'm left with is simply this, this kind of, I mean, now I'm using, I'm, I'm implementing all the unitarities, all the, all the contractions due to unitarity. And now what I get is this, this would be now the full correlation function. Uh, now, of course, assuming that S, X is equal to T because otherwise it vanishes for some given parity, let's say mu is equal to plus, meaning that I'm on the left side of the pair. And you see, I mean, now, uh, yeah, now what we have now basically is iteration of a quantum. Again, I mean, this probably makes sense only for people who have some experience in, in, in quantum channels, in open quantum systems, but still, I mean, you see, I mean, what we do now is basically we just iterate a quantum map, which I can define in terms of this operation. Quantum map means a linear 
algebra object which acts on a density matrix and it spits out a density, spits out a density matrix. Yeah? So now imagining this operator is a density matrix, so then this would be like a valid Krauss map or quantum map, if you want. A completely positive trace preserving, actually, or also unital quantum map. And there are two maps like this, but there is one we call M plus and the other M minus. And basically what we have now, correlation function is just the iteration of a quantum channel for time steps to, for two to three time steps, right? So see, I mean, what we map now is the calculation of correlation function along the right trace uh, to a zero dimensional open quantum system, to a dissipative quantum system of a single particle, which uh, travels with the light ray. And uh, this dynamics can still be non-trivial because, you know, this, uh, this is now a quantum Markov chain, if you want. And this quantum Markov chain can have a spectrum inside unit disk or on a unit disk. Uh, it has actually always by eigenvalue one, which corresponds to identity eigen operator, which is a manifestation of unitality. It conserves the identity. Uh, and uh, yeah, but it can have other eigenvalues, which can be uh, inside unit disk or on the unit disk, which means you can have a full hier ergodic hierarchy. I mean, this is like, you know, dynamical system, uh, 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 it's like a Markov, you know, uh, uh, Markov, Markov uh, expression for dynamical, you know, you can do this, let's say, for, Mar for, for Baker map models like that, uh, for the thermistic dynamics as well, but, you know, I just want to make an analogy here. So now we have basically understood how dynamics, uh, how dynamical correlations can, can behave. So uh, basically, basically you have to calculate the, the spectrum of this N plus and N minus, and then the correlation functions are basically, you know, there is just a spectral decomposition or eigenvalue decomposition of this, of this matrix, N plus and N minus, and then these coefficients are just the overlaps of the eigenvectors, left and right eigenvectors of plus and minus with, res with respect to these operators A alpha and A beta. So, so basically the point is that this is just a convex sum or some sum of exponentials if you want. <clears throat> so it, it decays, right? It generically decays. Of course, you can have non-generic non behaviors like even non-interacting dynamics, which would be when you have a swap. Swap would be a particular instance of dual unitary. So nothing decays. Then you can have oscillatory dynamics, which is non-ergodic, like when you have an eigenvalue, which is not one, which is, corresponds to a non-trivial eigen operator, but which sits on a unit circle, well, which sits at one, at one actually. So that means the time averages exist and they're not zero. But then this eigenvalue can be on a unit circle, but not at one, which means that you have oscillations persisting, if you want, if you want unit cycle, or, or nowadays people would call this time crystal. And then you would have, uh, you know, if all eigenvalues are in, inside unit disk, then you would have a generic, let's say, ergodic mixing behavior, behavior. So, I mean, you know, just to stress that these models, even though, you know, you may think of they are trivial, you know, the dynamics, yeah, it's almost trivial, but not quite. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm, well, I'm, I hope I can take another five minutes to conclude smoothly. Uh, so, there are a couple of, of course, uh, interesting questions. I mean, some of which we have already addressed, some of which are waiting for us or for anyone uh, interested, but you know, one of the questions, of course, which puzzled me, you know, from you know, even you know, we had this first result in the first paper, but the question is, of course, in general, I think very hard one is to classify all possible dual unitary circuits. Actually, to 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 to, to kind of, I mean, again, as I mentioned, this is actually equivalent to some problem in quantum information theory, which has not been solved, so it's not an easy problem. Uh, but you know, uh, we can actually classify this quantum dual unitary quantum circuits for d equal to two for qubits. Actually, there is a complete parametrization in terms of SU2s, which are one qubit gates, uh, and a Heisenberg gate, which is this what we call B of J, which is the XXZ gate with two coupling constants equal to pi over four and the third coupling constant three. So which means that this is, these guys are completely free. And you know, this would be completely general parametrization of SU4, if you want, or U4 the arbitrary phase. So the only constraints which we have to put is that these two jx and jy, let's say that this would be x, y gate, x, y, z gate, but the jx and jy would have to be equal to pi over four. So there's only, let's say, two constraints which deduce, you know, the number of free parameters by two from the full u4. So it's not such a, such a particular structure. It's a, it's a very rich structure. <laughs> um, right. So and, you know, you have interesting uh, examples in this dual unitary circuits. You have integrable circuits like uh, six vertex model or XXZ gate. And for this, I mean, this would be just a, a six vertex R matrix and which would be unitary for, for this particular uh, case of parameters. 
And uh, this uh, dual unitary, uh, self dual kick teasing model would also be an example of a dual unitary circuit. So the one I discussed before. Okay, and then there has been a couple of interesting works in the literature in the recent months uh, where people suggested generalization of either dual unitary circuits to arbitrary D. This is not classification, not, it's not a complete classification, but it's an interesting generalization and there has been paper by Claes and Lammerkraft. And there has been paper also by Boris and company uh, on generalizing the teasing model uh, for higher dimensional Hilbert spaces. Okay, so I, th I think I'm pretty much expired my time. So I wanted to say also something about uh, what can we do in for general non-dual unitary circuits because you know what I really find exciting is also you know something that I stressed in the beginning of my talk, namely, can this be structurally stable? And if this is structurally stable, meaning I can shake it a little and dynamics is still of the same kind of type, which means that I can go outside dual unitarity, but if I'm not too far from dual, dual unitarity, I can still maybe compute some bounds on correlation functions, for example, some exponential bounds on correlation functions, or even more, some bounds on spectral form factor, which would show then ergodicity, spectral ergodicity from the spectral point of view. For example, uh, it would show ergodicity of some problems which are, you know, might be disordered, like typical models of MBL, for which it is believed that they are localized, but you know, this type of analysis would maybe show the opposite. So it's, I think, interesting to, to pursue this further. <clears throat> okay, so now, uh, yeah, there is another, I think, cute result that is coming up soon, but uh, I don't want to go into any detail because it's still under, under, under development, but we can basically expand our results on spectral form factor for dual, arbitrary dual unitary circuits. Uh, an arbitrary averaging uh, which covers a bore uh, around identity, uh, you know, averaging with respect to local unitaries. So that means we take a general quantum circuit like this. This red and orange box, box are fixed quantum gates, but then these uh, circles are arbitrary SU2s, which are random. Um, yeah, and um, <clears throat> we can show that spectral form factor should be should be, uh, uh, a core, I mean, this has no time reversal symmetry, so it should be, should be following random matrix without a general dynamic limit. Okay, so now, uh, again, as I mentioned already, I mean, we have some numerical evidence, which was quite uh, controversial. It's been a lot, debated a lot, uh, which uh, using the same kind of concept, you can analyze standard models of MBL in the ergodic phase, and you can, you know, you know show that maybe these models, uh, are hard to localize in this sense. Uh, yeah. So there is uh, a, mo a paper which you can check on the archive. There was a second V2 put on, uh, put on the archive uh, recently. So there is something new. Even if you know the paper is worthwhile to check it again. I mean, there, there are new results. Anyway, so I think I have to close. So I have prepared another slide on operator entanglement, which I will just skip, I think. And uh, I will just go to my conclusions. So, uh, but instead of giving you, again, repeating the main uh, results of uh, my talk, I will just uh, conclude with the main challenge, challenges for future work. Uh, again, the first challenge, which is already partly undertaken, is, uh, is uh, possibility of proving some results on structural stability. Uh, so to have convergent perturbative expansions around chaotic dual unitary quantum <sighs> dynamics, like dual unitary circuits. Um, and then, um, yeah, the, as I already mentioned, I mean, uh, to go outside, we could again, perhaps use the same technology to, to address MBI-like systems and to, to, to maybe prove some bounds on, on, on possibility of localization of these models. And the third, which I have not mentioned, but I think it has to maybe connect it also to the third uh, seminar today, uh, and I think it's particularly potentially promising line of, of, of attack using this, 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 this type of method is to approach maybe proving ETH in chaotic, uh, dual, uh, in chaotic dual, dual unitary systems. It's not as easy as it might think because in, in showing ETH, you have to be able to control the other order of limits. So first time to infinity because you want to address individual eigenstates and matrix elements, and then uh, a, a thermodynamic limit, which it seems to be harder because then your system is not effectively infinite, it's finite. Uh, so you have to treat boundary conditions and uh, integrable chaotic boundaries if you want. Uh, so this is all in the discussions and no real uh, progress yet, but I think it's interesting uh, direction which I want to pursue. So with this, I would like to thank for your attention and sorry for being a bit late.
<clears throat> okay, let's uh, thank Thomas for a great talk. Uh, I think that there are some questions. Uh, Vladimir, you have your... your yeah, uh, Thomas, uh, can you show back again the same transparency where I asked the question about cardiac collaborator for Rainy? Can you show that transparency again? I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. It's in the middle somewhere. Of yeah. your lecture. Um, I don't know. I lost you. Yeah, I, know, I know. I know. I know what you mean. Uh, how can you move like this? One, like yeah. in the middle. Uh, no. Do you see my? I don't know. I mean, again, I'm. Do you see what I see? I don't. Do you see yeah. Right. 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 So uh, my my problem is the following: put n the small n equal to zero. Then this is trace of identical operator, which doesn't depend at, on time at all. So White's linear function uh, of no, time I, I, n equal to zero doesn't depend on time at all. No, no, but n, n should not be zero. I mean, well, you, you are, said it doesn't depend on n. Right, right. But okay. I mean, what we do is basically we use some sort of replica method. So we 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 use uh, well, but we don't have to do the, any. Uh, I mean, so what we do is. We take n copies, right? This would be for n equal to three, right? For n equal to three, uh -huh. to write reduced density matrix like this. Yeah. I mean, this would be like, again the same notation as you had before. So this would be like uh, time, and this would be space. And now uh -huh. you have the n and uh, the rest of the sides, and then you would take this uh, twist. Uh, uh -huh. So then you would okay. This would be now. This would be your reduced density matrix, and then you have to. No, this would be already trace of row to the cube, right? This would be trace of row to the cube. So we have three copies. Uh, so you mean this formula is valid for n small equal to three, correct? This formula is, no, no this formula is valid for any integer n other than zero, so. One, any one, positive, uh, how about positive integer? Right, any positive integer, right. Any, so, so mean like one, two, three, four, five, and yeah, further, yeah, right? right? No, this okay. is just an illustration for n equal three, but it's, you know. Any positive integer greater than zero. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, more questions? Any raise hand? Uh, yes, uh, Baram? Yes, maybe a question to the beginning of your uh, talk when you proved the RMT behavior for the infinitely long kick easing chain, where mm -hmm. you produced this calculation trick of this order. Um, do the limits commute? And if not, does this tell you something about uh, the dependence on this order? Uh, which limits? Which limits, which, which limits you mean? This order to zero and... Uh, N to infinity. Uh, so And L to infinity. Of course not. I mean, yeah. these limits don't commute. Uh, so, yeah. So what is the what, what what is the question? What's the rest of the question? Uh, so in principle, does this tell you something about stability properties in some way? So specifically, you said okay, I will even find it for the integrable uh, point when you set h to zero, or actually h mean to zero with some um, noise around it. Yeah. I understood you that you said you recover um, RMT, right? Even if sigma gets arbitrarily small, and this right. should be something about this uh, property of this integrable point in the sense of breaking. Right, right. Okay, yes, that, that's okay. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's, a, that's a cute question then. Yes, of course. It, shall, it immediately tells you that integrable point cannot be stable in this sense, yeah. Right. But, you know, uh, chaotic points will be, st I mean, we hope chaotic points will be stable in some sense. I mean, but because you can make this, this, this model chaotic by a uh, arbitrary small amount of disorder if you put disorder to zero limit at the end. So there is no way to have stable uh, integrable, uh, integrable uh, dynamics. Well, I mean, of course we can only, I can only claim what we see. So, I mean, uh, what we show here is that uh, transverse field easing is not stable again uh, uh, under, under, under weak disorder. But uh, uh, I would guess this is the same for a generic integrable system. I'm not sure if I, I, I answered. Uh, uh, actually, in, in parts, I still find it a bit um, weird to annoying that there's this non-commuting property because uh, one way to would be just to make the chain arbitrary longer and then you would not 
then it's not completely clear to me whether you would get really the same results. No, but uh, you would not expect this this limits to commute. I mean, that is mm -hmm. that would be really too much. No, I mean, because imagine, I mean, when you grow the system, then uh, uh, then the density of states becomes exponentially small, so uh, perturbation becomes effectively larger and larger. In any perturbative sense, it becomes non-perturbative. So at finite finite disorder. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Which would mean that your result effectively is also only true for systems with uh, disorder, even if it's just in yes, yes, okay. yes, yeah, yeah. Now, to be honest, yes. I mean, these are of course these are disordered systems. Arbitrary small disorder, but still finite disorder. Thank any you. any amount of finite disorder. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? I have a question. Aside, so the um, so one goal was to get this random matrix theory result, which is universal, and then I guess entanglement entropy is also universal. Is there anything, are there any other quantities that you would hope to get from the model? Because things like correlation functions are model dependent. What have you in mind? I mean, you have no. Uh... I guess my question is what what else? Um, so. Given okay, so, a palpable model, what else can you learn? That okay, you so, so what you can learn, for example, I mean, this is a recent work, which I have not even quoted, but you can find it in the archive for just uh, one or two weeks ago with a master's student. We have looked in the, into the fluctuations of spectral form factor, that is the nth moment of spectral form factor. And uh, for that, you know, that would give you in principle, well, I mean, not all, but uh, good information about higher point spectral correlation functions. And uh, <clears throat> that for that is uh, for that that you can compute with the, exactly the same trick, but you just need more copies of this of this of this. Uh, you know, for the second moment of spectral form factor, you need four copies. And uh, then uh, again, this algebra. I mean, then again, you have to then again you evaluate the the, the, the fluctuation of spectral form factor as as a counting of spectral counting problem for eigenvalue one of some transfer matrix. And enumerating that again amounts to d determining s this size of some algebra of commuting matrices. So it's a very, it's again, it's again the same trick. So this trick basically, yeah, be, I think it can be generalized to give you uh, not only two point but higher point spectral information. That is one thing. Then the other thing is, okay, I mean, maybe I, 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 can, I can still sh go to my last slide, which I have to skip, but there is this uh, operator entanglement, for example, which we have also addressed. I'm not sure if you would be happy with this type of quantities, but uh, this is actually something that is more, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's better characteristics of a computational complexity of quantum antibody dynamics. I mean, think of a, a, a local operator as a, as, a, as a Hilbert space vector and ask how many, well, I mean, how it gets entangled uh, under dynamics when you start from a local operator. And uh, it has been conjectured that this somehow, you know, is uh, modest uh, uh, for integrable dynamics and uh, it grows linearly for chaotic dynamics. And for this model, again, we can not, not really rigorously calculate this, but, you know, with some assumptions, we can exactly calculate this growth or entanglement entropy. <clears throat> so that is in this paper in I post. Okay. Thomas, uh, I would like to say something which I brought up in my talk, but I didn't make it clear now, but it's relevant to Boris Kutkin and you. Uh, you know, I named Hill determinant to determinant that Hill only computed for celestial, for the moon. It's a very specific problem. Mm -hmm. And the Hill formula, only the formula he and Poincare established connecting Hamiltonian Lagrangian formulation of orbits. So what I call orbit Jacobian matrix is stability, global stability of whole orbit. And now what the Hill formula says, which is much more general, it applies to all dissipative system. It basically applies to any systems where you have a finite number of neighbors interaction if it's discretized system or exponential fall of neighbor interaction if it's PDE. So you can always, when you're on a doubly periodic domain, 
you can always compute it by transfer matrix forward in one direction. That's called Hamiltonian evolution. You can always, uh, or you know, unitary operator for you can always compute it in spatial direction, depending on how many neighbors. So we do it for Kuramoto, Shivashinsky, and we need to propagate five dimensional field because there are more derivatives, etc. And you can compute it directly. So we always compute this determinant of Jacobian orbit matrix directly. You can do it by two methods. I gave you a geometric uh, description of volume of fundamental parallel pipette, or you can do the Fourier transform and you can compute it in Fourier space, which diagonalizes it. And you can produce all the eigenvalues of that object. And you, need to, you know, this duality is always automatic. I mean, if you decide to compute it by going from one edge, uh, in any dimension, you know, you can always write the transfer operator. You can always write the formula in which you are evolving this way or that way. So I'm just saying all of those things are now, of course, the light cone thing is some special thing no, but, that uh, has to be discussed. I must separately. say, okay, yeah, no, I mean, I don't think it's always the case. So, I mean, I think it's a very interesting question. So, I mean, you can ask the same question for classical symplectic many body systems like the ones you study, like this. Cat maps. Yeah. And cat maps have this dual space time dual property. That means you can define at least space, space dynamics. But you cannot do this for generic. I don't think you can do this for generic coupled map, coupled symplectic lattices. You can think of, I mean, basically the, the this circuit, circuit uh, cartoon I gave you, this can be understood classically. So you can think of these boxes to be two, two particle symplectic maps. Okay. And uh, then you can ask whether I can write a symplectic map, many body symplectic map, which, which propagates trajectories spatially. Yeah? And uh, this means it has to be, not only that symplectic, it has to be deterministic, right? It has to be one to one. Yeah, of course, it's always and deterministic in my case. In your case, yes, but uh, I, I claim in general it's not. Uh, I mean, you mean it? Yeah. No. I have some comments about this, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, so it depends what you really want. So if you really want full dynamics, so this is impossible. But if you want to think about monotremy matrices, so stabilities of these trajectories, yeah. so prefactors and semi-classical formula, so then it's yeah. always possible. So linear so is dynamics it, is always uh, Yeah, the relation is always for linear dynamics. I agree with so you. So this no, is but, important. Yeah, I understand. But this means that you, you say, okay, now even if my trajectory space space like trajectories are not unique i can still define yeah. this yeah, yeah okay you okay. still you See. still can work with monotremy matrices in okay, this okay way. no this idea yeah this on idea. each solution you do this and it okay. applies solution by solution okay i disagree yes but you see i mean we recently we have also worked i mean we have done some work on re, uh, reversible cellular automata which are again if you want caricatures really caricatures of hamiltonian dynamics right I mean, not Wolframs, but uh, you know, automata which can be flipped in time, and they are one-to-one -one, uh, in time also. And then you can ask, do you have space-time dual cell, uh, cell automata which are also one-to-one -one in space? And the question is yes, but you know, it's not a trivial question. So there is this rule 54, which is kind of very interesting because it's like a ultra discrete uh, sine Gordon in one plus one. I mean, it has uh, interaction, uh, and uh, king scattering, uh, solitons and uh, phase shifts and stuff. Uh, and you can do the full statistical mechanics of that model and you can also do uh, this, this, the spatial version of it. So, I mean, for me, this is like, this is even simpler in some sense. Okay, I mean, maybe it's not so, so, so much simpler than your, your sp because your symbolic dynamics is something like that, if I understand, right? I mean, you have discrete set of symbols and then you can sp do space and time. But, you know, so it, maybe, yeah, no, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm just I just want to say one more thing. I claim that uh, the computation of the Hill determinant directly from orbit Jacobian is much more robust and much quicker than doing by transfer matrix, especially if you're doing it numerically. So no. I think that's the thing to always compute. You can do it uh, with rough accuracy and you can get, you know, very good answers because you're doing it globally. Okay, now I, I have to think about this because uh, I'm not sure what quantity, I mean, at least in, in our context of quantum spin chains, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't even have an idea what Hill determinant would mean, but 
uh, what would be, is there a quantum version of Hilde determinant or something? Uh, which would yeah, it's linearization. So that's what we use uh, in one dimension. That's what we use in good solid trace formula. <clears throat> Yeah. You know, it's linearization of the whole orbit. And uh, when we compute the quantum weight of the orbit, we get a square root of da da da. And you can do it either by lolling in time or by uh, a settle point of, uh, of uh, orbit on the whole path integral, which is what I do. But, uh, so you actually know it, you're doing it. And as Boris says, it applies to linearization, no matter how nonlinear the theory itself is. Mm. Solution by solution. 